Let's go live. Quick Q and A. Very grateful for all the comments. <clears throat> all the comments on the last post regarding the uh, new book that should be coming out soon. And uh, that's it. I'm pumped up for it. I'm always grateful for the support from everybody because I know this, like buying a book for some people, that's not, um, you know, it, it's just not always in people's, how do you say, like, it's not like economically doable for some people. A lot of people got a lot of bills and you invest in me and I take that seriously. I would love to do a little bit of Q&A. It's 9.09, maybe go 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Uh, I had uh, multiple conversations today with strength coaches, football coaches around the country. I usually get on a phone call. Uh, I do uh, like these, um, uh, what do we call them, like an express coaching call. I have it on my ZachEvanish.com website, and I think it's like a 20-minute express co coaching call. It goes great. And the key is what, whenever I'm doing a coaching call, like this Friday, I have a one-hour coaching call with uh, – I think the coaches in California, I always say like, what is your goal? What do you want out of this by the end of the phone call? And I give them action. I don't just want to give them a bunch of ideas. Then they get off the phone. They're like, man, I'm just overwhelmed. <clears throat> so it's important that when I read something, I always said, okay, I've read something. Now I have to do something with it. And I learned that way back in the day, reading to, um, Tony Robbins, Awaken the Giant Within. I created this rule that I gave myself of read two pages every night. And then I said, all right, when you read something, what did you learn? You have to apply it the next day. All right, Moose Strong. Uh, we're going into wrestling season. Would, would, oh, what did you do as a wrestler to prepare for weight cuts? Uh, you know, I did everything wrong. A lot of people don't know about this, but uh, I blacked out during a practice. I went to the hospital. You know, I destroyed my body doing everything wrong. And nobody back then knew how to do things correctly. So I remember I was wrestling 152. My training partner was uh, 145. <clears throat> but I was weighing out of practice at 146. Every day, 146, 146. So I had this dumb idea. I'll drop a weight class. Wrestlers still do it. Um, they starve themselves. And then you get weak. And so that's what I did. I would have um, a cup of coffee for breakfast and an orange. Lunch was an orange, and then I would go running. I would usually do about a, a 5 to 10K run. So three to five, maybe even six-mile run. And then on the third day, I blacked out in practice and woke up in the hospital. But guess what else I stopped doing in season? I stopped lifting. And when you stop lifting, you get weak because I was busy running. And so this is a uh, you know major problem amongst wrestlers. I had to do this or have this conversation with a, a wrestler recently. He skipped a training session, told me his stomach hurt. And then he said, uh, you know, I said, oh, did you eat something bad? You know, like, did you eat the school lunch? And he's like, no, I just didn't eat. I'm trying to lose weight for the season. So here's the goal. Um, you're going to, wrestlers are not going to eat right after school because they're going to go to practice. So now you're skipping your normal after school meal. You're going to be burning crazy calories. So two weeks in, um, your metabolism is going to be kicking on a whole nother level. And it is not odd for athletes to lose, drop 10 pounds because you're burning so many calories. So I really like to see wrestlers eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's really uh, the ticket. Uh, let me see what we got here. <clears throat> if you even on even on days that you have a match. So if you are uh, even on weigh in day, if you can't eat breakfast, lunch and dinner, uh, then you're cutting weight and you're ducking the competition. And I question your preparation. Why are you uh, doubtful that you can compete at this specific weight class? I'm not strong enough. Well, then you should address your strength training. The common mistake coaches make, as well as wrestlers, but coaches do this. You know, I trained so many wrestlers for uh, close to a quarter of a century now. Kids will be like, yeah, we haven't even wrestled yet. We've just been running. Our coaches want us to get in shape. And I'm like, that is the dumbest 
I'm going to curse. That is the dumbest fucking thing ever. You want to get in shape? Then coach, have your guys wrestle. Okay? If you want them to be in running shape, you should have had them join the track team. You want to get in shape? Your job as a wrestling coach is to coach wrestling. And then what else do they do? Then they have to do plate circuits, Bulgarian bag circuits, blah, blah, blah. Wrestling is the most specific conditioning, whether it's drilling or live wrestling. Then... Fill the other bucket that has not been getting filled. Do your strength training, okay? Let's see what other questions we got. I got a little crazy. I dropped an F-bomb. I shouldn't, but I did it. I did it. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, I'm scrolling to see if I missed a question. Sorry, guys. Sometimes, damn, it's a lot of uh, people popping through, and then I end up missing questions. I'm, I'm, I'm cruising through. So, uh, yep, there's the wrestling season question. All right, whatever else we got. Whatever else, guys, let me know. Let's see if we got something. Whoop, I think I missed that question. There we go. Three meals before 3 p.m. is the rule I give athletes. Um, breakfast, lunch, and then you eat right after school. The kids that lift at my high school, I want them to eat a peanut butter jelly sandwich or have a protein shake, and uh, that's their quote-unquote meal. Then they go home, have an early dinner, <clears throat> and then uh, dinner again. In season, breakfast, lunch, dinner, unless you don't have to cut any weight, which I love. Yeah, cutting 13 pounds in one day. Yeah, you're all you're doing is making yourself weak. You know, it's like goes completely against what we're trying to do, which is be strong and powerful. Coach, any updates on Gladiator Minimal Training Manual? Uh, we have on Train Heroic for I think I've had it for three years now. I have the Minimalist Training Program. Make sure you're on my newsletter, guys, because I linked it up this morning. Go to zackstrength.com. I linked it up or just go to my Train Heroic page. Go to my, I mean, it's all over my website. Go to ZachEvnish.com in the search. Type in minimalist workouts, minimalist training. You'll see all the articles and then you will see links to it. What's your favorite after practice conditioning for football if the coaches insist on it? I'm not on the field with the football coaches because when I train a team, Next team's out, I'm a bit on a time crunch. There's another team or actually multiple teams coming through. Um, but I would really look, if I was there, I'd be like, well, what kind of work did we do during practice? And by the way, some athletes, some football players, they hide and they actually don't get involved in the practice. So if I saw that there was a ton of running, I may not do any running. I might do like a quick calisthenics finisher like Five squat jumps, five push-ups, five, four, three, two, one. We might do that twice. Maybe we don't do it at all. You know, I would, strength training after a football practice is tough. And uh, football players, no offense to you guys, you don't have the mentality of wrestlers. Like you get a little bit sore, you, you can't train, this and that hurts. Wrestlers hurt all the time and we train anyway. So uh, I hate to break it to you, but that's what I see in football players um, there's a, a lack of intensity and intensity is important. You know, a lot of coaches are like, well, how do you measure intensity and effort? I could see it. <clears throat> if you are a coach who's been doing this for even a short amount of time, a month ago, I had a coach come and visit my high school and then come to the underground. He saw multiple groups at the high school and he saw a difference in each group and each sport, and it comes down to the mentality of it, and it comes down to the culture of it. Um, the phone calls, the consulting calls I had today with coaches is, you know, <clears throat> it was, <clears throat> we, we hit upon this. The strength coach has a culture, but if the sport coach does not meet or match that culture, then there is a, a clashing and most kids are going to take the easier road. What is the easier road? They're going to do that. Um, and so for the most successful schools, the most successful athletic programs, the culture is the same whether it's in the weight room, 
uh, soccer, lacrosse, wrestling, you know, boys teams, girls teams, and it's also uh, supported not just through the coaches, whether it's a strength coach or sport coach, supported through administration. And then the message gets relayed to the parents and the parents know, ah, there's a standard. That is the ticket. Garrett Timko, uh, figure I know the answer, but especially with winter sports picking up on practice volume, how would you explain to coaches why strength training is still important? Well, <clears throat> I would look at some basic ways to explain to them. I don't like to uh, fancify things like these other gurus do. So I look right now at our school. We've had more injuries in my high school in the first you know, four to six weeks of school than we did collectively in four years. And then we look at who did strength training in the winter, who did it in the spring, and what was their injury, and uh, were they able to make a comeback from the injury or did it require surgery? And so you have the hard evidence. Then the other thing is to build a total athlete, we need to, I know Mike Boyle gets credit for this, but he gave credit to somebody else. And it wasn't a strength coach. I, I can't remember. It was like an economist. It was about filling the bucket. <clears throat> so what's the bucket? I'm playing basketball. I'm jumping. I'm sprinting. I'm cutting. I'm going at high speed. Well, we don't need to add more of that because this is why we hear about overuse injuries. So my daughter just finished tennis, high velocity sport, all concentric, very aggressive. <clears throat> what's the next three weeks of training going to be? Lightweight, very slow eccentrics, no explosive work and working the smaller stabilizer muscles around the scapula, the shoulder girdle, the trunk, anti-rotation because she's constantly doing rotation. So we're creating balance. And I think you got to sit down with the coach and try to explain to him or her. And so um, Mark Hoover does a great job. He uses technology. And so let's say he puts um, the uh, GPS system on them. He sees the distance they run. And then he, he'll compare it to their top speed, flying 10, flying 20, and then top speed in a game. So he quantifies everything. Me, I don't have technology, so I break it down in an easy to understand manner. <clears throat> Zach, how did you incorporate sled work in your basement lifting days? So when I had the gym out of my parents' garage, I purchased the sled from Louis Simmons. That sled arrived with a book of stamps taped to it. We would put the sled in the back of my truck and we would go to um, empty playgrounds. Um, elementary schools in the summertime are closed, so they always had the fields because we would use the monkey bars, the pull-up bars. Um, anywhere there's grass. When I was, uh, same thing when I had my first house, we would do all of our sled work down at the field. Uh, the other thing I did was, if you've seen, uh, been inside the undergroundstrengthcoach.com website, Underground Strength Academy, um, we, we took a front end tractor tire, drilled a, <clears throat> a hole through the tire, got the um, eye bolt, and used that for sleds on the street, the rubber tire. Doesn't make noise like, you know, a steel, a steel sled does. Good to know I'm on the right track. My approach is pretty similar. They show up, but the video isn't live. Can't watch. Not sure what you're, what you're talking about there. I missed it. Okay. Sorry. That's Josh Beeler. Josh, hit me up. Not sure what your question is. If you could make a physical test or physical abilities test for law enforcement, I love it. <clears throat> what would you include and why? Um, max body weight pull-ups and also one rep max weighted pull-up because sometimes you're pulling somebody up, you got somebody on your back. Um, I would do some sort of a sprint, probably a 100 meter sprint. I'd also want to see 400 meter. And I don't know if I would do a mile. I would probably do, you know, short distance, um, 100 meter, maybe even shorter, you know, 100 feet. Okay, so like 30 meter, uh, quarter mile, 400 meter and 800 meter. <clears throat> because you have to be able to sprint, take cover. Sometimes you're chasing people. And now what we're seeing is cops getting chased by angry crowds. So I might want some more uh, conditioning, a little bit more 
of a different energy system. I would want to see um, trap bar deadlift four. I had this conversation actually with John Wellborn about making a record board for high school athletes. Five rep squat, five rep trap bar deadlift, vertical jump, five rep bench. But uh, here's something else that would be on the test. Um, I would incorporate some sort of wrestling or grappling match. So um, how long does it take you to handcuff somebody that and, and make them give up? So I would time them and I think it would have to be under a certain time, but I wouldn't know those numbers, to be honest with you, until I did research. I would go to multiple police departments and ask them how long it takes to handcuff um, somebody who is resisting arrest. I would do this in suburban. I would do it in inner city <clears throat> and start coming up with like a uh, average. So I want to see some application through that. Um, I would also, I mean, I would really make, I would get some specificity to it. So we've got power, strength, stamina, uh, wrestling somebody else. And I think there would have to be an obstacle course involved. Similar to like what you see some of the uh, Marines or, you know, SEALs going through. Like you've got to um, climb over a wall, jump. You've got to balance on something. You've got to climb over a fence. And I would make them do it in their police gear. So it, it's weighing them down. They're, wear, they're you know, wearing a uh, armored vest. So how can they actually move while they're in specific gear. So I love that question, you know, kind of catching me off the guard, but I think I, I hope I gave you a good answer. Broughton, thank you. Much love to Australia. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Uh, push ups, chin ups, deadlifts, sprint. Yep. Don't go one and a half miles. Thanks for always answering. My pleasure, Hudson. From your 189 friend in the Midwest. Bang. Bedtime. Yep. Oh, yeah, Jim Wendler, Dan John, anything they say is awesome. Paying attention, three minutes, national average for backup response. There you go. And that's another thing. Uh, can you have a three-minute wrestling match? Um, I watched a video yesterday of a uh, off-duty cop, a female, and somebody, I don't really know the context, but that guy Colin Noir posted it. I don't know if they had some sort of relationship, but supposedly she was trying to help the guy. Then he tried like mugging her, tried taking her gun and she had to wrestle him. She had a um, round in the chamber. She shot him. I think she shot him more than once, but now he is, his family is suing the, uh, the uh, police officer. Jeff, what's up, buddy? Jeff's awesome. <clears throat> so I think I answered um, all the questions. Bad connection, bad connection. I really like that question on the police PT test. And I also think police should get tested every year. I'm going to turn 48 in five weeks. If I was, a, you know, 20 years on, that means I would have been a cop at age 28. I would still be good to go with running, deadlifting. Wrestling might be a problem with my knee, but I could grapple somebody. I could clinch. I could get them down. And I've learn to adjust my wrestling because of my right knee. And the, this uh, application of street grappling, so to speak, is so important. And I'm really shocked when I see police officers that look completely out of shape and unfit. They are a target. That actually inspires criminals because they feel like nobody could stop them. And the other problem that um, law enforcement face is that from what I understand, like unless somebody murders somebody, you arrest somebody, they're, they're, they're out in a day or two. I mean, the criminals are running free. It's a pretty, there's no repercussions in this world. That's the massive problem. <clears throat> All right. Good night. Yep. I believe state police get tested every year. Maybe I'm wrong. I'd have to ask some of my buddies who are in there. Um, yep. This guy says we don't have fit. You know, you got to create your own standard. Those of you guys that know my buddy uh, Griffin, he's, you know, in all of like the early days, underground strength manuals, all those PDFs, the early days. He's the man. 
So um, he's about to be a uh, chief of police. And of course, he's the guy that built the weight room. Randy and Gladiator Strong. Yeah, buddy. What's up, my bro? Gladiator Strong is really where everybody should be. Here's my buddy Griffin on this page doing the uh, leg raises at the elementary school, uh, doing kettlebell snatches. We would go to the elementary school and, uh, you know, the guy that asked about the sled, I would put a sled and a prowler and a sandbag and a couple kettlebells back there. And Griffin and I would just destroy that training. And uh, Griffin became a cop. And what did he do? He kept getting in better shape and stronger. And so that is something that he implemented in his uh, department. And uh, a year, eh, it may have been two years ago, I had police come to me um, to help me uh, when I was working with Sornex. I helped them outfit. They had a very small space for a weight room. The problem actually was, was that these guys wanted kind of the squat racks and then you had these other guys that wanted like machines and cardio equipment and it forced the squat racks closer together in an unsafe manner. And I told them, listen, you need at least seven feet between each squat rack. And those guys just kind of, uh, I think they had their uh, pressure from the other guys was like, well, we want, you're getting your equipment. We want our equipment. And in turn, um, I think it's a pretty tight space. But if there's only a few guys in there, it should be safe. So that's all I got, guys. I think I'm going to shut it down. Uh, the encyclopedia, I believe, is going live on Halloween. Had a little uh, issue with the formatting. See how it's half white, half black on the bottom? You can see there's a little sliver of white on the bottom. And hopefully Amazon could fix it. And I, I hate to tell you guys, they may not be able to fix it. And we might have to just leave it that way. So, and it's going to stay matte on the inside. It's not going to have glossy, fancy cover. And uh, no other book like it out there, baby. All right, team. So, that's all I got for you guys. I'm shutting it down. Much respect. Have a great night. Thank you, everybody.